Acharya is our chief guest. Our keynote speaker, Mr. Siri Dara Singh from Medics, is ready to start as soon as we are done with the introductions. We have uh, Mr. Clyde Uno on my extreme right from Swinzy Corporation. We have um, on my right Stephen Collins from Ripplecom. And then we have um, Dr. Mr. Gurmeet Chopra from Alpasan and Avinash Vashenta from Polar. So without further ado, I would like to begin with our keynote speech. So, Mr. Hari Daya Singh on yes, BPO Industry Best Practice. Hello everyone and good morning. Uh, sorry for the delay. Um, so what we're here to talk about are best practices in the BPO industry. Subject that we use as a just words we talk about. They're actually the way you have to operate your company. And you, you have to do this for two reasons. You have to be extremely process driven and you have to convince your customer that you are process driven. Because if you are not, it's dependent on personalities, family relationships, or lowest cost. Of understanding what best practices are is to show your customers that you know how to do the right thing and to actually do the right thing every day, go to bed, get up the next day, and do the right thing again. My experience has been through a couple of startups in India, one called Health Scribe and a later one called First Ring. One provided healthcare back office, so we were under extremely stringent controls. The American healthcare requires very strict security. It's a very competitive market. There's uh, tools like speech recognition. There are tools uh, that allow the US staff to work uh, almost on par at some of the same pricing as it is in India over time anyways, and also in the financial services sector, not particularly in banking, but we work in the credit card sector, again, with extremely high levels of security requirements within those processes, and the need for incremental improvement is constant in both of them. Uh, both of those companies that we started off uh, made it to safe harbor in acquisitions, um, HealthScribe uh, is now owned by Immodal, which is actually owned by J.P. Morgan. And uh, First Source, First Ring, our uh, call center company, is now owned, uh, is merged, and is part of a publicly traded company on the Mumbai Stock Exchange known as First Source. Um, as we started off Medics, which is based here in DACA, where we have about 30 software developers, some of the most experienced in the world, on the Android platform for Google Glass. We now are moving into our second stage here in Bangladesh where we're gonna actually start doing scribe operations. Um, we will be employing about 2,000 people growing with our partners that we intend to get here in Bangladesh <coughs> for probably another 5,000. We're, we're in India with a company called First Source, which I knew very well and the only group out of Bangalore and uh, IDS out of Delhi and Chandigarh. And all of them I chose because I knew they had had the best practices in the healthcare industry for over 15 years. Now these, these global industry best practices, they come about in segments. There are security best practices. You can go and find what these security best practices are. They are listed very squarely in the ISO um, arena, and the ISO area, the SOC 2, which also has process um, certification in it, and in the high trust, which is the new security standard for healthcare. You can go and you can find these. They're documented. They're on the internet. You can get third parties to come in and audit you on this. That's a best practice standard that you not only have to live, but you can actually show your customer that you've gotten to that level. Um, risk management within the BPO industry. Customers don't want to go and save money if they're worried that there is political risk that's going to shut you down. They're worried about infrastructure risk that's going to shut you down. So the best practices in this industry is you've got to have two of everything, sometimes three. Diesel generators, sources of fuel for your diesel generators, internet connectivity, perhaps even more than seven, uh, to ensure, and political risk is something that is a very real issue when someone is choosing their BPO partner, the partner that they're going to rely on. Our company, 
we outsourced internally from our US where we have about 200 employees to Bangladesh. And about a month ago, we were getting ready to process a payroll and we couldn't connect with our cloud-based payroll processing company for a few hours. Some of you may remember there was a bit of a problem connecting on the internet for a few days. I can tell you that sent ripples through our company and we are totally committed to Bangladesh. <laughs> But that opportunity wasn't dealt with very well. So when you're looking at risk management, realize that best practices require you to make sure that your company and the industry you're working in does have backup available. Contingency, security planning, um, you'll probably hear words like disaster recovery plans, DRPs. You're gonna have to get used to those. Those are part of best practices. You already know you have to have your diesel generator running. But what are you going to do if you show up at your office and it's flooded? Can your people walk to another building, log on to computers, and keep working? That's the world that we work in after some time. Now, even with the cost savings available in Bangladesh, you are going to have to show your customers that they can count on you. Um, again, up time and disaster recovery, we're talking about all the redundancies that need to happen in the best practices area. Um, as we go through, you are going to have to establish that you can give reporting that lives up to best practices. Can you prove what it is you're saying you can do? Do you have the history in your, in your history of your, your data analytics? Can you prove that what you've done, you can do again for this new customer? Now, best practices in this is going to vary by your industry. They're going to be looking for things like utilization rates, call handling per hour if you're a voice-based call center. There's a lot of best practices um, that are going to vary by your industry, but they exist. You can go into the COPC, the, which is the general the call center industry, as a professional organization that has a lot of best practices in that. But you're going to have to prove that you can hit those numbers. Now, in the beginning, you won't be able to. If you're going to try and take on voice, you're going to be doing outbound work, which is the low-hanging fruit, the work you get started with. If you're going to be doing web development, you're going to be placing ads, pop-up ads, you're going to be trying to draw eyeballs. All of those types of work that you're going to start out with are going to have best practices and you'll get those from your customer in your specific industry. Change management. No matter what it is you're doing, whether you're bringing on a new customer, whether your existing customer is telling you something has to be different than has been going on, you're going to have to learn how to make people comfortable as you go forward and make these changes. Can you tell a customer that as you bring on more and more of their customers, are you going to always put a brand new person on that brand new account? Or are you going to try and move some of your experienced people off of existing accounts and onto those new ones as they come in? You're going to have to show that you can manage change. Change management, if there's one rule of it, it's document, document, document. You've got to show that you have a plan. There's an old saying in the US that no plan ever survives, and unfortunately it's an American saying, but it also does. But that no plan ever survives the first shot in battle. No battle plan. And the same thing happens in outsourcing. You plan, you plan, you plan, but you also get ready for your contingencies. So as soon as you start implementing, something is going to come up you didn't think of. And inshallah, we can't think of everything. We hope it's going to work. And we, through experience, through process development, through best practices, you will get that risk lower and lower each time. Invest in training and development. There was a time when business was bought things that were expensive and you paid people little. That's not what BPO is. BPO is smart people getting paid well. And one of the things that everybody learned very quickly in India was, oh my God, look how cheap everybody is. Let's hire all these people. Wait, where are all my people? Oh, they worked for me for six months and learned how to do the work, and now they're gone to all the other ones that hired them. And it happened to be time and time again. The churn of your employees is high. So you know what you have to do? You don't sign contracts with them that promise that they have to work for you for the rest of their lives. You pay them well, you make the work environment exciting, you give them a career path. You have to invest in your employees. 
best practices is no longer cheapest and just hitting the minimum mark to retain your customer. Keeping those employees is a different model, especially if you have nighttime work and you have females that are being asked to leave the home for the first time in some situations. You have to make a workplace where people want to be, families want their children, because a lot of young people come into BPO where they want them to be. So you're in competition for your people. Now there are global concerns over human rights. You're, you're going to find most of the jobs in BPO pay very well. You have nice air conditioned environments. They're working on computers. It, it, it's a pretty good, but people in the US and Europe, they have kind of a blind eye. They don't really know what's going on and you have to kind of explain it to them. One of the standards is the International Labor Organization to make sure that you're meeting all the, the local area for um, minimum wage and things like that. But you've got to meet them. You can't mess around with that. You can't try and play games with it. You have to have lots of pictures. You have to show that they're happy employees. And you have to actually have good environments for your people to work in. The global BPO industry is an opportunity. But it's going to take hard work. And it's not going to be one rich guy spending a bunch of money to make it work. It's going to be more like ants pushing something very heavy up a hill. Everybody has got to participate in it. You've got to earn that client confidence. Your best practices have to show them that you can do it. You have to develop your analytics and your insight into the future of that pro process that you are outsourcing. You have to collaborate with your customers. You have, con you have the need for constant process improvement. Remember that term, constant process improvement. You're going to be collaborating with your customer, and then you're going to do it all over again because somebody's going to come up with a new idea that can make it even better. You have to make a commitment to the outsourcing careers of your people. You have to make sure that your people want to keep working for you and will help bring on that next bigger, better, more profitable customer the next time around. You're going to develop a community. You're going to have to develop a name for yourself. You want to be the place where people want to come and work. And that's where you get to the peak. There are quite a few existing places where you can go and get these best practices. I can talk about them for hours, other people can talk about them for hours, but they exist already. These are the places where you can get your security and process best practices, you can get your International Labor Standards Act, and then you can talk to some of the, the accounting and consulting firms that provide these types of audits, and they can talk to you about how they can validate that you are, in fact, utilizing the best practices to earn your customer's trust. Any questions? Or we can wait till the other <coughs> did another uh, short presentation. Yeah. Um, so thank you very much, Lisa. I mean, so uh, there's another short presentation, and then our uh, discussion will begin. A uh, big round of applause for our uh, you about uh, some of the best practices, but also I think uh, some of the uh, trends that are coming up in deep room that uh, all of you should be extremely aware of, because you don't want to be kind of uh, doing things uh, right now that there won't be any market for. I'll skip quite a few slides because uh, I think in the interest of time and also uh, based on the topic of the you know, discussion. Uh, you know, if you look at it uh, over the last uh, few years, uh, you know you had uh, you know 50 cities, for example, of the Toronto report 2009, and 10 increased to 100 cities, and then there were the concept of emerging cities, but that year two cities essentially, and that really got a lot of prominence. And so people were not just simply saying that we want to send things off to Manila or to Bangalore only, but the people were interested in all the emerging cities because there was a certain level of excellence there. I think all of this basically says that there's significant competition out there and 
there is a need among customers for near shore stuff. There's a need for certain centers of excellence, and there are uh, you know countries uh, that do a good job of trying to market as a regional uh, hub as well. Uh, you know, some of these slides basically say that uh, really the uh, industry is very very strong. I mean, if you look at it right now, India is doing about 87 billion in IT and BPO exports only. Uh, Philippines is the number two with 18 billion, with just about uh, less than 100 million people population. And Latin America uh, is about 15 billion, and that's been a phenomenal growth in the last few years. Uh, China, even though it's a very big country, a lot of companies out there has really been very successful in outsourcing, and that number is not going to change anytime soon. You know, people were saying this thing, a lot of people were saying 15 years ago that they would be the big competition. And really, I mean, for, for some of us uh, who work in this industry, we didn't see that. And even today, we don't see it. So China, in my view, is not a competition for the next 10 years, and I don't know even how long we situated. But look at uh, Latin America. And uh, you know, I think there are certain good things about Bangladesh in terms of, one of them is the favorable cost component. The salaries, uh, uh, you know, are definitely compared to Indian tier two cities, and you know, Dhaka is definitely not a tier two city itself. It's a tier one city. Like, for example, Colombo in Sri Lanka is a tier one city, but the cost out there is also, uh, you know, pretty competitive. So I think that is, in my view, a very very big attraction to clients because you get all the tier one for tier two prices. Um, Again, I think uh, the other strong point about Bangladesh is uh, the talent, which is available. 160 million in population, um, but like, uh, you know, but you really have a significant amount of uh, graduates, which are the tertiary graduates, essentially. I think one of the things I would advise is, which is happening across the globe, is to really you know, make this talent a lot more industry skilled. And there's this concept of national occupation standards. And it is happening. So the good thing is that the countries are basically collaborating and saying, you know what? We're, not, we're going to allocate designing of the occupation standards for retail, for ITITS, for automotive, for healthcare, to a certain country. So a country can take the leadership, and we all will adopt it. And India, for example, has got that uh, allocation of the IT and ITS uh, you know, skills to be done. But I think in whichever program we're doing in terms of skilling in the country, I think we need to kind of be aware of the national occupation standard and make sure that we do that. Because right now what happens is when someone gets trained, the industry does not know at all how good that trained person is. Nothing. I mean, for example, when you graduate from a UGC certified university, you know the minimum level that is there. But in, in the training, there is a and law is supposed to be that. So it's not certified content, not certified trainers, not certified uh, trained people. So. Uh, you know, again, what are some of the change drivers for site selection? Not much, but I guess you know, the talent uh, and, and cost and availability is definitely a very, very significant thing. Uh, just you know, very quick view on what are some of the trends that are you know uh, there in the industry. And I just put down Accenture Technology Vision uh, primarily because I was the chairman of Accenture in India and Bangladesh and Sri Lanka most recently. But that's not the reason. I think each and every one of you should go and look at on the Accenture website about the technology trends that have been done for 13, 14, 15, and what will be done for 16. It really gives you a view of uh, you know what the industry is as, as it relates to the industry itself, but also very much on the IT and BPO front. I mean, things as the internet of me, I mean, the, a lot of customization is happening out there, out of the economy, but it's a BPO business, it's really clients are focusing on what outcome you're giving to me. It's not about having 5,000 transactions, but what is the business outcome that a BPO company is delivering to me? People are really focusing on that. Intelligent enterprise. Now, if you look at the IT development itself, is becoming very, very agile. Things that used to take nine months for development are now becoming only three months uh, in terms of development. Uh, you, you will hear about, uh, this is not uh, this is not future, this is current. This is not a science fiction movie, it is reality. You will hear about smart, uh, liquid, 
applications, intelligent applications. So where you know you there's a lot of reusability. Applications are healing themselves up, you know, they're healing themselves for the bugs and things like that. So really speaking, I mean, the world is moving very fast. I think we all have to basically really be very much aware where the world is and be relevant to it. And the workforce, again, you know, I, mean, I know there's a big freelance population in, in Bangladesh, which is good, because I think the work of the future really is going to be very significantly a virtual workforce. I mean, there's a company in the US called Arise. It does not have a single call center office of their own. They have 15,000 agents in the US. I don't know how many thousands they have in the UK. And all of them work out of their homes. You are able to get very experienced people working out of their homes in their own time. Right? And all of that technology is virtual. And this is not, nothing new. They have been there in the business for 10 years. Uh, you know, some, some disruption, disruptors and game changers that you should all be aware of. All be aware of. I mean, right now, finance and accounting, BPO, the health scribe, you know, you know, the BPO is going to be there. It's going to continue. But like, for example, uh, you know, just uh, you know, uh, what he was talking about is the fact that the Google Glass, things are, you know, the doctor basically is seeing a patient, is being broadcast to someone, and they are scribing it right there itself. It's real time, right? Uh, so th that is real time. I mean, eventually, a lot of that stuff will probably get automated as well. Right now, let me just say that uh, companies like Accenture and IBM, last year, they had, uh, let's say, 100,000 BPO employees globally. About 15,000 of those jobs have been automated. Not will be automated. In just the last one year, it has been automated. So this is real, guys. Right? So again, I'm not saying that those the work that you're doing will disappear right away. But the fact is that you probably can say that what you're trying to do today will not really be a business five years from now. So in what you, so you have to see so what where you can start using software robots. That's what people are using. Also, artificial intelligence is coming in. Cognitive computing is coming in. Let me give an example of cognitive computing. I know these numbers, are, these terms are very big, and you say, you know, this is for the future. I don't know. Today, the big four companies are using, one of them is, is using Watson, which is an IBM product. Watson, basically, you feed all the content, and so what are they using it for? They're using it for audit. They're feeding client documents, audit documents to the Watson, and telling Watson how to read those documents. It's a machine. They've made it learn how to do an audit stuff. And there's no way any human being can churn, read, analyze so many documents. So they are really going to use Watson for audit. It's possible. It's, ha it's happening right now. Right? So, so just be aware of those things that you know when uh, that these are some of the things that are happening, which we somehow need to slowly incorporate in our operations. Um, everything is becoming as a service. You know, people are saying, you know what? I don't want to buy the hardware. I don't want to maintain it. You know, uh, someone can look at my software in the cloud. I just give it to me as a service, really. So, I mean, for example, if you have a big software package called SAP. The people say, you know what, I don't want the uh, you know, problem of implementation all this stuff. Just post it on the cloud, let me use it. Just if, you know, when I need it, how much I need it. Digital. Now, digital, everyone hears the word digital. Now, now what digital really is not the fact that you put things in cloud, the fact that you're using a mobile app and all this stuff. Yes, those are the components of digital. Social networking and uh, you know, analytics. But what digital is, integrating all of it. Now, when you say integrating all of it, just because you use a digital to just change your current process to it. It be the same process, but you digital that is absolutely not much. That's just the starting point of this group. What digital is when you really transform a process. Let's say, for example, if, uh, you know, good examples are Uber. Okay, that's, that's digital. Like say, for example, if you are buying a car and you get an SMS from your, uh, uh, from your banks and they will uh, give, a, give a loan for this, which is a pre-approved loan. How did that happen? And they also say, by the way, there are two more dealerships nearby which you may like to look at this car, this car. And we will give you this kind of a loan for those two cars. How did that happen? Because you're not in a parking lot, you are in a dealership, you have a smartphone, there is something smart chip on the car, they know you're looking at a car through the GPS, and they know that you are interested in that car, they know your history, they know you have all of that stuff, and they're able to give you, uh, give you that information. That's integrating all the elements of digital, by the way. Uh, open innovation. I think this, in my view, is something that Bangladesh should uh, should really implement. And sir, I would actually say that this is something 
uh, which is very, very important because people are grappling by how do they really adopt digital. All the brick and mortar business, this is not about technology, right? For example, uh, Pizza Hut right now is saying, can we use the Uber kind of network for delivery of pizzas rather than having their own people, right? Uh, uh, and because their business has really been disrupted by lots of uh, uh, new businesses that have come up with. And uh, hotels are being disrupted by something like Airbnb, for example. Right? So all brick and mortar businesses are getting disrupted. So all businesses, you know, when I was the chairman of Accenture, the big clients used to come to me and say, help us in innovate. I mean, literally seriously, because they know that it is going to disrupt the business. Open innovation is simply a, having a startup ecosystem so that the, these big businesses that connect to the startups. And really speaking, what this is that if you can just implement a platform, it doesn't take much, where you are able to look at all the startups, incubators, accelerators, VCs, angels, as part of that platform. And, and in these startups, you can bunch them according to industry verticals, maybe a five or six industry verticals. And when, when clients are coming in, when clients are coming into Bangladesh, or when you are pitching to clients, you include in your solution, which is relevant, something from that startup. You know what, the clients will really love it. Because my clients are there, 25 big Fortune 500 clients, where we have done this, they love those clients. And, you know, Accenture obviously is acquiring one digital company every month, but none of you guys, and most even Indian companies and IT companies cannot do that kind of an acquisition. But I think this is a great way of getting into the digital world. Also, I think GICs, you have a great garment industry over here and uh, very good brand names. There's a very significant push for these multinationals to establish their own centers in countries like Philippines, India, and it can happen very much in, uh, in Bangladesh. So I think you should really focus, have a separate initiative of how you can work with some of your government industry brand names to have GICs over here. You know, again, uh, cybersecurity, I think we started off with the best practice there. It's a very significant issue. It's not an IT issue. It's a business issue. Because when, when something happens, your business can get significantly impacted, like Target and Sony and other things are, are examples of it. So, so just realize that you should start having the security discussions with the business people also. Um, you know, again, start thinking in the digital world, not by products and services. Start thinking because you know th things have changed quite a bit. You will find Googles and other things getting into the automotive industry and all this stuff. So really speaking, don't think about the product and services. Think about uh, your market now being shopping, producing, learning, staying healthy, traveling, and paying. Think about that. So that way you'll start uh, looking at your customers' needs in a very different way, which is what's happening out there. Uh, again, I've just talked about the open innovation platform. Uh, basically, and more than happy to help. Uh, in fact, uh, Salons is doing a uh, you know, work for the World Bank and BCC on strategy for IT, BPO, as well as promoting. So all of the stuff will be included as part of that stuff. So, uh, again, you know, uh, I'll skip some of these slides uh, because I think I'm running very much late in time. So thank you so much, Sonia. Thank you very much for the presentation. You can have a seat if you have a few minutes, or, or do you need, yes, okay. So um, just to recap a bit before we begin the model of the panel discussion, that we heard about the BPO industry from two big companies that are two in the BPO space. For Bangladesh, that we aspire to be in that space and we want to grow. I just want to recap that we will, in our discussion, we'll start with some of the internal drivers that, that are important for the BPO industry, the external drivers and the risks. We've all seen what the advantages are, and there's no question on what the difficulties can be there. Um, so I'll start with Steven. So one of the external drivers for a successful BPO industry is to have a robust IT and telco infrastructure. Um, and I'd like your comments from Wimpocom's point of view on, on what we can do in the value chain to add here. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, just a 10 second explanation of Wimpocom. You all know Wimpocom is uh, better here as, as bank lending. So, uh, People got the second largest mobile network operator in the world, although the brand is extraordinarily unknown. So, if we think about Bangladesh here in, uh, in Bangladesh, then it's been contextualized uh, a few comments that I'll make. Um, you're absolutely right, Sonia. I mean, of course, people call it Bangladesh, neither of them are BPO providers. 
Uh, but we are an integral part of the uh, the chain. Uh, what I think uh, for us is most important is to be able to provide um, resilient and reliable connectivity. Both speakers have emphasized the importance of uh, a digital infrastructure to uh, DPO provision today and the evolution of uh, DPO provision in the future. Uh, what we need for that, I think, uh, most importantly, is, uh, of course, uh, a high degree of, uh, of investment. Investment is brought by uh, a stable political environment. We heard from the first speaker about some of the uh, risks, not these uh, political risks, but also, I think, uh, there we should also think about regulatory risks. Uh, in order for a company like Google to invest uh, significantly in, in uh, developing digital infrastructure in Bangladesh, uh, what we need is a, is a stable and progressive uh, regulatory environment, uh, both on the, the telecoms and, and internet side of things, but also the fiscal regime. Both of those are very, very important for companies like that. Thank you very much. Um, Ruby, I'll come to you for my next question. It's basically focusing on the internal drivers that, that help you move into the industry. And we've seen that if you don't have efficient processes and then you outsource, you don't really get a great result. So process to be very efficient in order to get out the desired outcome is important. What are your comments on that from your perspective? Unless until you have the processes in place, you will not be able to satisfy the customer needs and uh, the, the, uh, some of the process certifications that we're talking about, like COPC or uh, or uh, <clears throat> the ISO standards are, is, are basically you know, a platform to tell the, uh, the client that yes, we have uh, everything that you're doing at your home. In here, we understand what the processes are, and it's not something that we are not aware of. So those are very, very critical elements for uh, a client to take a decision on whether to look at a, a service provider, a vendor, for uh, outsourcing the operations because it's like a check, check in the box. They know if those guys are compliant with these standards, they know the business, they know how to do the operations, and they then start looking at more deeply, try to understand the organization culture, try to understand uh, what kind of people they have, what kind of uh, domain knowledge they have in order for them to succeed and grow the business. Thank you. Clive, I'd like to get your opinion on um, the next question that most of the times people try to focus on their core competency and then they outsource things that are not vital to their business. But there is a, you lose control when you outsource. That, that is one of the things that happens, right? So what are your comments on, on this span of control for the BPO industry? Okay, Sonia, thank you very much. My name is Kunal Uno. I just came from Japan. Uh, this is my first uh, trip to Dhaka. And uh, I enjoyed a few days with all of you. And uh, first of all, let me speak out my impression uh, of your country. And I just stayed for three days. And uh, I had another function I uh, joined two days ago. And this is second conference. And uh, my feeling is uh, big differences uh, between Japan and Bangladesh. It's Japanese is uh, our company. Uh, current most concern is uh, globalization. Okay. And uh, but Japanese uh, technology driven and very advanced uh, high level technology we have in the world. So continue next a couple of decades, still Japanese will sustain uh, current high level. Okay. But I recognize you, you country BTO is handling west and east. Okay? It means you have very heavy global experience to support the Japanese company. And what I might, my, my concern is, uh, the issue, okay, the first issue is you have uh, globalization advantage against Japan. Okay. Second message is, uh, BPO concern, I think, I believe, uh, Japanese people is culturally very isolated. As you know, I mean, as you may not, you know, but they concern about only about your people. Uh, they do not know overseas people, 
not only your country, but also America and European people they are not familiar with. So give them more satisfaction to give them confidence in your country's cultural difference and tell them what you can deliver for them. This is the major concern my 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 at this time coming over here. So uh, uh, totally uh, my message is I think I believe uh, your country has, or your BPO has, uh, heavy globalization advantage you have. And you have uh, confidence for those areas. Okay? Second issue is recently Japanese BPO friend is simple work to more complicated, sophisticated area, which Japanese people, customers, worry about whether they can deliver those uh, BPO work to Bangladesh or not. But you can give them confidence based upon your experience. I have, uh, I believe your current uh, BPO background. So you need to proceed on with your uh, pride and dignity of your country. I can success. I believe you can success for those areas. So this time my impression uh, while I'm here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'd like to open up to the audience. You've heard two of the speakers, and this one of the each panelist had answered one question. So does anybody have any questions for the audience from this audience for the speakers? Please don't be shy. It's very easy to raise your hand and ask a question. Why did Joy put film this? You know, uh, can be prepared. Uh, you are well experienced in other countries. Uh, India, Sri Lanka, or I'm not sure. Uh, what do you think where Bangladesh stands today? Uh, are we ready as a country to compete against these uh, big players? Uh, and uh, to you, uh, that, uh, you mentioned that uh, China is stuck at $9 billion. Uh, why they're uh, stuck? Uh, why China? <coughs> Yes, I mean, ever since we started in India, we went uh, to other countries looking for opportunities. I worked in BPO in Pakistan, in South Africa, in Central and South America, in Fiji, in Australia. Bangladesh is on the launching pad. You are in an incredibly unique position right now where you do have these seven internet connections. You've got a government that wants this to happen, and yet you still have labor costs that have the advantage that make all the effort it takes to move to work here still worthwhile. Just like when India was ready, when we, there was a famous thing that happened in the year 2000. Everybody in America was afraid all the work here was going to crash and get the program to write. Oh my God, how are we going to do all this work? India was ready to take that work and do it very cheaply. They built a huge software development group based on that. But it was only because they did it well that people kept coming. Bangladesh is in that opportunity now. When I grew up as a child, going to Japan meant things were very inexpensive and not made well. Over 20 years, everybody wanted their Lexus. We paid a premium to get that Lexus. Then India came out. Oh no, it's India. Who knows what's going on there? Now they've actually proven that when you hear an Indian accent and voice on tech support, Americans are relieved. Bangladesh is going to find its place, but now is the time. Get started, get ready. It's ready to happen. The world, the, the salaries in America are flat. Not because there's not business in America, but because the opportunity that the internet gives us all to move those jobs out, constantly seeking the lowest cost quality for Make it quality and make those customers rely on you. Be great. Thank you. Now, I think uh, going back to the China question, I mean, some of the things uh, that uh, Shudeya talked about, uh, definitely. I mean, I think, you know, uh, if you look at uh, Philippines, it was really the fact that um, they are very good English speaking. They understand the Americans like extremely well because they follow the, you know, the religion uh, as well as even the soap operas of the TV as well as the games, the basketball and things like this, all the US stuff. Right? So they are very much 
uh, a US uh, you know, centric uh, country in that sense. So I think that really has been the thing to, the, to an extent today, uh, really, uh, you know, the client doesn't want to send uh, customer service or the voice business to India, you know, if, if it's Philippines. Um, in terms of Sri Lanka, uh, in small country with just about uh, 20 million people <coughs> population, but the fact is uh, because you know it, there's a slight negative part in the education system is just uh, uh, where they can't really uh, have a lot of people in the colleges, so they really someone came up with making them accountants. So right now, the Sri Lanka has the second largest population of UK qualified accountants after UK itself. And that really gave them very significant uh, you know, skill sets in the FNA. And they are definitely the top five country in the world in terms of the FNA capability. Now, coming back to, and again, uh, I think India sees the opportunity in the Y2K time frame. China really hasn't been, I mean, their, their one thing was the, pop, you know, the population. The size of the country itself is, is, is great. They have great graduates, engineering, and all the stuff. But they have not been in. Number one is language. I think English language is the most important aspect of that. I mean, even when you go to Latin America, where there's a lot of affinity to the culture itself, but the issue is the language. So, I mean, they're doing well. I mean, they will continue to do better than China, but English language is a big issue. Um, the other thing is the culture. I think the culture is very, very different. It's very different. Uh, you know, when, uh, when Shreya talked about the fact that they did it well, I think the concept of doing well has not come in the services industry in China. If they can bring the doing well concept that they have in products, if they can bring it in the service industry, nothing like it, but they have not been able to agree. Really. So any product that comes out of uh, of, uh, of China is, is, is a part in terms of the software service. Maybe because they are not able to communicate, they are not able to understand the customers well, the customers are not able to understand them, I think that really is a lot. Thank you. Uh, I think there are some questions. Would you please tell me the uh, affiliate? I want to know the thrones your company gives, thrones activity, or actually you, what kind of support or service you provide uh, on the PPO industry? Please, if you, I, I would say, I would like to, I actually know the, in depth, no, actually your company, you will tell the World Bank, your, you want to give a, what's on the World Bank? I, 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 I so, you know, so Thalons is a consulting company you know, since 1999, at that time called Mio IT. What we have been doing is advising the clients uh, in terms of where, which country they should go into and which supplier. So, most of the only big contract, big companies uh, in the US, UK, Australia, etc., chances are, you know, myself or Thalons was involved in it. Uh, but today what we do is we do a lot of country consulting. So Latin America country, Bangladesh, Philippines, <coughs> uh, other places, we, and we consult uh, with them in terms of what should be the strategy for, for the country in terms of what BP work, what IT work, um, and also which markets would be the best for a, a, a country like Bangladesh uh, to go after, because it's a very competitive landscape. We, and just because India did something, we, we cannot necessarily replicate that stuff. So that's what we do. So you know, I'm I'm definitely uh, you know uh, here to see as to what we can do. In, in fact, even when I bought uh, uh, the GPIT, which was a dummy for uh, and made it Accenture, the idea was not just for business. It was the fact that I have a passion of going into countries and uh, seeing what I can do to promote the IT people industry. So I look forward to working with you to you know help achieve that goal. Of uh, making this industry a billion dollar industry. Thank you. I've been asked in the interest of time, we have 17 minutes left. The Honorable State Minister will summarize the activities. Two questions, one here and one here, and, and then we need to roll. Comment to me. Actually, uh, good morning. My name is Mahatma. I'm the managing director of uh, AMRA. Um, actually, I don't have a question, but I have a suggestion because uh, I think our Honorable State Minister also has cleared on the various agenda. Rather a few bells in my mind because I was just speaking to some of the distinguished speakers um, about the readiness of Bangladesh in terms of infrastructure and in terms of skill set. Where we are lacking in actually, I think, um, taking off um, in terms of being uh, 
which is a strong BPO destination, is probably um, uh, certain uh, barriers are out of place in terms of this conception. And I think a lot of that misconception can be cleared if we have a very focused approach towards um, targeted um, customer groups. I'll give you an example. Bangladesh is today a garment factory for the world. And I think every large uh, uh, retailer or uh, around the world is, is either sourcing or is about to start sourcing from Bangladesh. Now, a lot of these stores, stores like H&M, stores like Walmart, stores like uh, you know, uh, Sears or JCPenney, have a huge BPO uh, uh, organization working for them. So why uh, should we not want to ride on those existing relationships where we have the infrastructure today, we have experts who are sitting here in the, in the panel willing to work uh, on behalf of Bangladesh to teach us BPO and to try to uh, you know, enhance our skill sets. What we really need to do is a very focused approach on a few large customers like uh, like an H&M or like the Sears or like a Walmart. Land uh, a few such model like uh, deals or, or, or BPO outsourcing deals. And I think that will set the right stage for seeing is believing uh, kind of approach. Uh, so my humble request uh, here is that we can uh, help organize, and I hope uh, back home can take a leading role in uh, to organize such, uh, such a roadshow of some sort. I'd just like to make a comment. I think that's an excellent idea, but uh, you know, you have to keep an eye on uh, uh, fact that uh, when you are talking to a JCPenney or a Sears and trying to convince them to look at Bangladesh as a location, the first question they would ask or want to understand is, you know, what is the size of the industry, how big the service providers are, where can get where can they get the talent from? That's where you know the first stumbling block happens. Gone are the days. Gone are the, the days when you know India, Indian BPO industry. If you look at it had the other way around, outside in uh, approach, where there was UI 2 k they capitalized on it, exports were a bigger part of uh, the BPO industry, and then now today if you see, a lot of domestic outsourcing is happening. That story will never get repeated anytime, anywhere in the future. What you need to do is, this is an angle definitely you need to pursue, but you need to have scalability in the local domains also being created by way of you know government doing a lot of digitization as part of the the e government uh, strategy that yesterday we heard about that could give impetus to you know creating number of jobs creating the uh, people who would be willing to do those jobs then the comfort factor will come in because if you look at a Sears or the jc penny and talk to them okay what is your video when the guy says okay i have three centers in the world with 30000 people Total, what is the industry size here? It's not even 30,000, or maybe it's just about 30,000. So they, these are some of the factors that you know you have to keep an eye on, keep the ball on, and focus, have a dual approach, uh, both to make the domestic outsourcing scene uh, bigger, competitive, and create the, uh, the industry out here. And obviously, start uh, realizing, uh, talking to these large suppliers who are anyways your customers in the garment side, to really uh, see how they can uh, uh, do uh, both garment and IT BP also from here. Thank you, sir. I don't know if you're aware, but uh, in uh, there is uh, a domestic uh, outsourcing has started. Ambra is one of the leading players in the state as we speak now. Um, the government is also setting up what they're calling the high tech park uh, concept, um, where uh, it will have a ready infrastructure for new startups, especially who struggle actually um, to find capital to set up uh, the right infrastructure. So that is, like I said, we are on the we are on the takeoff runway as we speak. What we need is a little help from our friends. Uh, and a coordinated effort will make a huge difference. There's a few questions. Uh, do you have a quick comment? A really quick comment? Yeah, so one, can go back to one, the one, one comment. Uh, Very quickly. Please. The first time I'm from Japan, and uh, we did more in Japan and Bangladesh. A uh, big cultural gap among those that. But most important is trust each other. Trust for the one or four years. This hotel is also uh, supported by Japanese, exactly the same as in Delhi Hotel. So I think very strong, uh, important uh, issue is how to trust each other. Thank you. 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 Thank
for many cities. And finally, your, your national flag is rising sun. Japanese flag, flag is declining sun. So we need your support for other standpoints in the next decade, two decades. I ex expect you to, you to have confidence and trust uh, each other. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Good morning. <laughs> I'd like to ask a question both for my, on behalf of myself and the gentleman next to me. Um, my question, mine's more like, because we're all here to promote the agenda of setting up PPO industry in Bangladesh and the, for exposing Bangladesh to the international scene. But so far, from my experience as an investor and an entrepreneur, there seems to be a genuine lack of confidence in the skilled map part that we have available in Bangladesh. And the fact that this government has taken the initiative to set up infrastructure for this industry to thrive, but yet, as we know, that we haven't had many success stories, and why it hasn't been that India, Philippines, and now you've mentioned Latin America, which I wasn't personally aware of, but why haven't we started even, like, why is this a starting phase for us right now? And to, uh, and to add this question, since this is the best industry practices topic, what will be, like, a, could we have, like, a SWOT analysis of Bangladesh? Like, what will be the main threats to Bangladesh in the industry? As well as, what, what are our actual strengths? Thank you. Let me just start. Yes, it's to anybody. Yeah. But you know, uh, Bangladesh is a very young country, right? And we're, we're on the verge of takeoff in getting market share with the BPO industry. Um, Medix is in Bangladesh, and you heard Amra speak. So we're slowly making progress. There are definitely a lot of infrastructure issues that we need to solve for. There's talent that we're working on. We have 40 private universities that, that are creating students, and they're coming up. But that's pretty new, right? If you compare to other industries, previously, what the talent and manpower is being built. So with that, I'd, I'd ask for others to comment. But yes, we're young. Yes, we're on our way. So hold on. You, you'll be, you have a lot to invest in. Anybody else? Just trying to very quickly do a SWOT. <laughs> <laughs> Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Um, this is non-comprehensive in the last five seconds. Uh, strengths. I think youth, uh, obviously, uh, education, skills, enthusiasm. Uh, it's a very, very long list, but, but uh, the strengths, I think, for, of, of Bangladesh are, are absolutely huge. Weaknesses, I think infrastructure, it's absolutely obvious. Um, countries like Bangladesh, of course, will continue to invest in the country, um, but for that really to, to be maximized, we need we much greater, much greater policy and regulatory stability, as I said before. And I, I think, again, the fiscal regime needs, needs examination. It needs to be much more converge as as telecoms and I, uh, and ICT converge we also need converged regulatory and fiscal regimes um, opportunities uh, I could go on forever there I think the whole the whole panel and the room will understand the opportunities are, are endless absolutely massive um, threats again I think the, the biggest threat is is not to seize the opportunities so when we think about the strengths and the weaknesses um, focus on the strengths address of course, at the same time, the weaknesses, and then you very quickly see the opportunities that way. Uh, yeah, just uh, for the point of view of what we've seen so far operating in Bangladesh, getting software developers, moving some of our back office, which supports our company in the US right now, I know for a fact that it can happen. I know for a fact that it can work. The only risk to me is maybe a thousand other people try to make it work and we'll fail at it. And then my customers in the US will point to them and say, Bangladesh didn't work for them. I don't actually care about them. I know I can make it work. I believe it can work on the million people level, on the billions of dollars in revenue level. But I know it can work small. I'm not worried about the country right now. I'm trying to get my 30 developers up to 60 developers. I'm getting my 20 financial services and HR people up to 60. I know people in Bangladesh can do that, and that's what I'm doing. There's a lot of big picture things. I know it's a tradition to ask government for a lot of things. That's not what I'm doing. I know all of you, when I go out and hire you and your relatives and everything, it's going to work. That's what I do in this one quick 
but the other not looking off into the valley of the Thank you very much, Rita. Any other questions from the audience? Um, yes, you have a microphone. Go ahead. Short, you have five minutes for Q&A. My question is, <laughs> yes, he has his closing remarks. He will summarize uh, all of that. Two questions at the back, please. Uh, microphone to Peter Nienda. Uh, very short, short, crisp questions. So we can give one-line answers. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's not a question, it's a suggestion to the Honorable State Minister. Yesterday, we have heard that the uh, government would be providing training for 50,000 uh, personnel who would be interested in BPO. See, um, uh, I believe that not just providing uh, training would be sufficient here, because uh, practicing shooting and going to the battlefield is two different ballgames. So, what I suggest is, um, if we could invite some of the larger BPOs who have actually succeeded uh, uh, till now, uh, if we can name some Pipro, we have got Infosys, uh, we have got IBM Dutch, and there will be several other uh, BPOs uh, who actually know how to do the business. So now that government has put so much emphasis uh, into this, if we could invite some of those BPOs to come up and set uh, their offices here, like what we have done uh, for the garments industry, that would really uh, help the other uh, entrepreneurs here to learn the business before going into the battlefield. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's great feedback. And John is going to summarize the objective point. Last question. Choose one person. One more, please. Thank you. I would like to ask our state honorable state minister. Nowadays, our parents don't want to permit us to take CPO as a, as a profession. It is often taken as an additional and profession. The culture thinks it is not ma a major profession. What measure we can take to reduce this kind of perception? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, one more. Last one. Uh, my question is from the Minister of Foreign Affairs. That uh, last week we did the second meeting of IFA, but in PM process mentioned that the Bali Convention and treaties will going to implement in our country. But uh, we also see that program computer executive actually arrest for the piracy of the Microsoft software. But uh, at this point in Bangladesh, actually, we are not ready. I think that 90% of our people using piracy software, and we are working this sector. So is it the best time for implementing battery expansion convention here, or we need more time? You know, um, to uh, embrace genuine software, what you do is you're, in, you're promoting <laughs> my comment. So, you know, thank you very much. Have a seat. Um, what we'll do is now give the floor to the Honorable State Minister to do some closing remarks, his observations, and also address some of the questions you've asked. So thank you for being very gracious. Now the floor is the Honorable State Minister. Hello. Uh, thank you, Zulia. Uh, thank you, the keynote speakers, the presenters. Uh, uh, it, it was certainly uh, an eye-opener for me and for uh, many of you, I'm sure. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, you know, uh, drawing attention of the panelists. Uh, you see the arch and, you know, people already complaining about uh, not doing enough. You know, that itself uh, is a very positive sign. That means that they, they want to go ahead, they want to fly, they want to start, uh, they want to make progress, they want to make the businesses big. Uh, may I just politely remind you all of that all these only started uh, six years ago. You know? What you see today is the efforts of last six years. It's not more than that. We know all that about a decade ago, uh, quite a few uh, Indian and regional uh, institutions came, uh, attracted the students, offered diploma and you know, undergraduate courses. But there were no infrastructure, there were no job, there were no future, and uh, those efforts were not successful. Because uh, you know, if, when you talk about infrastructure, it's not just the high speed, seven different options of internet connection. It's not about only, you know, whether it's uh, subway cable or terrestrial. It's all about uh, getting people ready, give them the education, uh, give the investors the money that they need, the startup funds. You know, all uh, all these elements are part of infrastructure. Uh, so it's it's good to see that you know there are enthusiasm from both the sides, and uh, the big players uh, you know uh, representing here and who uh, talked about their experiences in the regions and uh, in other countries. Uh, they do believe that Bangladesh is ready. 
you know, we are at the takeoff stage. And that uh, is uh, a huge achievement, I think, of this uh, present government under the leadership of Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina in the last five to six years only, uh, where we have a uh, lot to do. Uh, we, we, we completely agree with that. And look at the involvement of the decision maker or the policy makers, right from the top uh, to the uh, officials from the ministry and the uh, private sector. Uh, and everyone uh, is up with it. Everyone has the confidence that, yes, we can do it. Uh, there are, uh, you can go on and talk about it. Uh, you know, Dr. Stephen uh, quickly did a 30 seconds uh, SWOT analysis. Uh, we know all that uh, if we compare, uh, and that's what my experience is, uh, I, I have no idea how you know, this industry operates, or very little idea. But as a student of business and an active, or I used to be very active in textile trade, and I take uh, very well the comments made, uh, I'll come back to that. You know, defying uh, all the odds, you know, the worst possible uh, uh, political unrest that we have had in the recent past, let's say 2012, 2013, the election year, the industry, not only the government industry, the overall export of Bangladesh is still grew. Uh, we, we met, we have uh, constant growth. Even this year, uh, we, we, the industry grew by about 11, 12 percent. I just saw the report yesterday or the day before. You know, that's just the true resident nature of the people who uh, work uh, in Bangladesh, not just in the government industry, in all the industries. Look at these uh, people who, you know, make these uh, tiles out of nothing and exports to Japan and, you know, to France and why not, those terracotta tiles. And there are many such clever products that they have invented that without any support uh, or as such without any support of the government. It's just that uh, sheer uh, enthusiasm uh, and uh, aspiration to do better and uh, represent the country uh, better. And this is an area where everyone is, is, uh, is, is working uh, in tandem uh, in dancing the same field, if I may say so. Uh, we, we know uh, I was uh, there just three days ago uh, launching, uh, inaugurating a, a financial company who came here to raise, uh, raise about $200 million to invest in startups in IT sectors. And uh, we have seen and uh, learned from, uh, from them that why they think Bangladesh is the next destination. We know what the big number, the, those, all those big players uh, like Gartner or, you know, ATK Global or Goldman Sachs has said about the industry in Bangladesh, in general, the IT industry, the big industry uh, in general. And the good thing is, uh, you now, nowadays, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, the people who are the prospective buyer of our services, they will come and teach us, and they will come and share, as they just did uh, in last one hour or so, that how uh, the Bangladesh industry can be benefited from the experiences that they have in India, in, in uh, Sri Lanka, in Philippines, and in China. And we know the, uh, we, you know, we know, this, uh, I'm not sure whether they know, that let's say the, the number one skill that you need to do well in this industry is your ability to speak in English. And we know in Bangladesh, the English we speak, uh, hardly anyone uh, can identify that it's a Bangladeshi accent. You know, we, we have a very neutral accent uh, in English, and that will help uh, tremendously the industry. Uh, uh, talking about the challenges, the price and the quality, uh, you know, uh, obviously it's, it's new, it's nascent stage, but as an insider of textile trade uh, of last 20 years or so, the first 100 buyers that I met, 80 of them complained about price and quality and not uh, making a commitment. And the last time I met them, uh, seven, eight years ago, out of 100, same 80 buyer complained about the same thing. But the mind of business still grew by many folds. The industry of Bangladesh grew from $2 million to $2 million. But you, you know, you must not undermine the customer's requirement. Uh, you know, customer is is, is the guy for business. You know, you must listen to them. And in, in in today's environment, there are you know many challenges. But we still have uh, some policy, some infrastructure. Uh, the president talked about the regulatory framework, the financial regime, and uh, you know every now and then you see that our Ministry of uh, Post and Telecommunications Ministry, the ICT division of that ministry, they do come up with proposal with the government and it takes absolutely no time. It always gets fast-tracked, the policies, the, the new rules and regulations. 
I know the people who were uh, freelancers, they were, they were having a problem of receiving the payments uh, from overseas of online payments. Government has recently enacted the laws to pave the way for those individual, uh, individuals and freelancers to work freely uh, with their customers. Uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's better, uh, I was uh, uh, talking to Sonia that, you know, more I speak, the more I expose that, you know, I know very little about this industry, so I must uh, limit. Uh, <coughs> but, uh, the, you know, uh, at, at the end, I'll only say that <coughs> there are very few uh, failures uh, for Bangladesh as a nation, especially where the government, uh, when it comes, to, when it will talk about the government, it's uh, the political leadership and the executives and the private sector who has worked closely together. We cannot fail. Uh, we we can achieve uh, the target that have, was set out by the industry, uh, achieving the first billion uh, dollar from this industry by 2018. Is that right? Uh, and uh, this will be a driving factor, none other than the <coughs> honourable advisor of our uh, IT advisor. Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. He himself uh, leading from the right, from the front, and anything to do with this industry will, will keep on getting the top priority and uh, uh, we will fast track everything possible to make uh, and pave the way for the investors, the little investors and individuals to work. And the other elements that we all know, the Sheikh has talked about it, that out of this 160 million, good 60% are, are young populations. And you know, they, we do not have in Bangladesh uh, the, the penalty met the question that we face that there are barriers from the parents uh, to work in this, uh, this industry. Uh, you know, uh, with, with all uh, due respect, I must be careful when you know you, you complain about your parents uh, not allowing you to work here. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I can share my own little story in two lines that back in the early 90s, uh, my fellow uh, supervisor at the Institute of Business Administration at the University of Dhaka gave me a C grade for working in the garment industry and I didn't listen to him. And I'm glad that I didn't listen to him because in my business we have about 20,000 workers working and we have a turnover of nearly 170 million dollars. Had I listened to my teacher on that day and went to work for a multinational financial or a uh, consumer product company, uh, you know, what's the maximum to do? You know, to be the managing director or the director of the company. <laughs> but you know, to be an independent, you have to defy all laws. You know, you have to listen to your hearts and your minds. And by that way, we can achieve the, the goal that we have set up to. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for your patience. And then the session has ended. We have another session. So thank you. Uh, I request everyone to have take a seat. We have a small little uh, ceremony. That is, uh, I, yeah, I request uh, Mr. Wahid Shirley, Vice President of BAPO, to come forward and uh, present a press to our Honorable State Minister, uh, Mr. Shirley Alam of Foreign Affairs. Mr. Sharia Alam. I now request uh, Ms. Sonia Bashir Kabir, Managing Director of Bangladesh, to come And uh, now Mr. Siri Daya Singh, Vice President of Operations of Medic. <coughs> I request my 
Mr. Gurmeet Chopra. Mr. Gurmeet Chopra, Senior Consultant and Africa Specialist of Afghans. Uh, now, Dr. Stephen Collins, Group Chief uh, Corporate and Regulatory Affairs Officer of Wimplecom Limited. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everybody.